Okay, uh, Congressman Fatimbari, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I will start with the refugee crisis and it become international crisis. And you've said that security risks of the Middle East refugee or migrant crisis must be conf confronted and resolved to keep the world safe. What should be done to make the world safer without harming the U.S. values and principles? Well, it's a hard question and a complicated question, but at, at a level of first principle, if you will, Persons have to have their life protected. Uh, that's a fundamental aspect of human dignity. And it's also essential to the principles of civilization itself. So the responsible nations of the world, the United States with partner countries, must try to attack the root causes of what is causing so many people to have to flee their homes. The United States shouldn't do this alone, nor can we do it alone. And it's particularly incumbent in the Middle East on Sunni Arab nations to fight for values, to fight for the protection of innocent life, to fight for uh, the principles of civilization and stability and order itself. So this is why the, the horrific manifestation of persons having to flee for their life and leave their homes has left all of these questions somewhat unanswered. But as an immediate concern, you have to try to take care and position people as close to where they came from as possible. And then you have to work on the ultimate political, economic, and security settlements that create stability and the right of return to people who've had to flee, and for the future, their participation in governance structures for their own safety and well-being. This is what's so tragic, particularly about the, the loss and the persecution of religious minorities in the Middle East because of ISIS's assist, uh, systemic attempt to exterminate them. Definitely, I will ask you about the minorities, but uh, I'm reading between lines what you're saying, that to create a safe zone in the region? Uh, I have proposed and talked publicly about the possibility of a safe haven, particularly in the Nineveh Plain area, that would have its own type of security apparatus tied perhaps to the uh, Peshmerga and the Kurdish government with some type of linkage as well to the Iraqi central government. In that way, this sub-autonomous region, if you will, can create stability for people who have had to flee with only the clothes on their back, uh, the ability to return and build out a thriving culture and thriving society that has existed before, that has coexisted with multiple religious um, con uh, confessions. If we don't do this, and the, and the Middle East is emptied of people simply because there is security and um, cultural conflict, uh, then there is no chance in the future for it. That's why this proposal is so important. It not only meets the needs of the humanitarian crisis, but it creates the long-term conditions for stability. Let's focus on the Syrian refugee crisis. Um, it's becoming an international, as I said, crisis. President Obama announced that uh, announced a plan to accept 10,000 Syrian refugees despite terrorist attacks in Europe and here in the United States. What strategy should the U.S. adopt to handle this crisis? Well, again, the, the first order strategy is what we are already doing in providing substantial assistance, approximately $1 billion of assistance to the Kurdistan government, to the Iraqi government, to the Jordanians, to Turkey, as well as Lebanon, to help take care of the migrants, the refugees. Second, you're trying to contain ISIS's advance and the slaughter and mayhem that they've created in Syria as well as, as, well as Iraq. Uh, that has to be further developed, though, with partnering countries, particularly the Sunni Arab world, to stop the slaughter. After that, then you have to have, and in a parallel fashion, the discussions and the ultimate um, solution through security, economic, and political settlement, both in Syria as well as in, as well as in Iraq, that will allow the full participation of persons who have had to flee and, and have their uh, rights not only protected and their life protected, but their, the possibility of them uh, being engaged in political structure. So the, the, the actual smaller question is about refugees, for those persons who are in dire circumstances and who need to be relocated, the larger questions have to be have involved the structures. What about the smallest questions to bringing them here in the United States? Yes. Uh, there are about uh, 2,000 refugees that have been approved or have been already on their way. Uh, the larger question is creating some very deep concerns 
as to whether our, our security screening processes are robust enough. The House of Representatives has already passed a bill that would uh, try to address this because we have concerns that if persons who are intent and in using their so-called religion to kill and take other people's religion away, as we've seen with ISIS, they don't belong in America. The ISIS atrocities against minorities in Iraq, especially Yazidi and Christian, uh, was a topic of uh, many uh, meetings here, many, at, at, even in, at the Congress, and it was des designated as a genocide by the Congress, two resolutions, and by the State Department. What action you suggest after that? What comes after that? Yeah, it's an interesting question because when we were able to pass the genocide resolution in the House of Representatives, 393 to 0, which is a remarkable transpartisan statement that no one disagreed. Because again, this is about transcendent principles, the right to life, protection of human dignity, the principles of civilization itself. It was really a very strong moment. And in fact, as the Yazidi community in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I live, told me, it brought smiles to our face. We still, scar, we still have the scars and the pain of the unresolved conflict, but this gave us hope. So many people have said that, who are particularly, particularly those who are still there in the region under grave threat. What it does, the genocide resolution, and then the subsequent declaration by Secretary Kerry, it puts the full weight and authority of the United States government in declaring the reality of what has happened, a systemic attempt to exterminate entire groups of people based upon their faith. This is wrong and it's unjust and it creates the gateway for further policy considerations about what we just talked about earlier. The right of return, the reintegration of ancient faith traditions back into their ancient homeland and how those people, those persons will be protected and allowed to better participate in governance structures so that this can never happen again. Those are unanswered questions, but the policy debate is continuing, and I'm so thankful that the genocide resolution served as the marker and therefore the gateway to integrate this principle into the larger discussions of the security and economic settlement in the Middle East. Congressman, there was a suggestion or suggestions by many experts. Uh, for example, uh, here at the hearing at the House last week about sort of program to bring victims of the ISIS atrocities and genocide here to the United States because the, the United States does nothing until now, the moment we are talking about that. So uh, to, to, to at least save those minorities or those victims, uh, is there any effort in this regard in the House? Well, again, we, we do have a refugee resettlement policy and persons, again, can meet the test for refugee uh, resettlement because of persecution. And so there's a process by which people have to go through and it, it takes a very long time, frankly. So those processes are already in place. Now the expansion of that and then the security concerns, particularly about Syrian refugees, we, we don't want anyone to slip through in here who could be in any way affiliated with ISIS, has, is a legitimate and real concern. So uh, we, but again, we tend to focus all of our concern and effort on the migration portion of this and the refugee portion of this. The more fundamental questions, while we'll continue to do that for people who have legitimate and dire needs to be relocated, is to create the conditions in which people can stay in their homeland. The reason I'm asking this question, Congressman, uh, because when we ask the government, State Department especially, especially about that, uh, they say that there should be uh, legislation in the Congress so the, the government will act to bring those people to the state. Well, first of all, it was interesting this morning, I met with a number of new Americans, people who have come here, have immigrated here, and are proud to be American citizens. Ask yourself the question, why do people want to come to America? It's something we never talk about. Why? This is, ultimately, it's a values proposition the ability to find oneself and actualize the self in economic activity through freedom of worship, through freedom of speech, to be able to reflect the political system. There are people, certain people around the world who do not accept those values and then will actually come into such systems, use the freedom in order to take the freedom away from others. 
they don't belong in America. Persons who want to come here, rebuild their lives, make a contribution, live freely, worship, help themselves and help their neighbor and participate in the American system. That is the hallmark of the values of, of this country. It gets more difficult because we, there are capacity limits that America has in other, other countries. Uh, you have to prioritize based upon the circumstance that people are in. And then, again, as a world leader, joining with other countries, this has to be done, this, this question is one that has to be worked on while the first question is resolved. What is causing people to flee? And that's the deeper crisis. Okay, and dealing with ISIS. Yeah. That's the question, the biggest question. So, and my question to you, what suggestion you have that the next president of the United States should adopt, a policy adopt to, to in the Middle East, to win this war, to win the war against ISIS? Well, uh, the, the Iraqi central government has to regenerate itself. It has to uh, respect the values of inclusiveness so that certain segments of Iraqi society do not feel excluded from its, its power segments. Uh, America has sent troops back into Iraq uh, in order to help stabilize its military effort. I would like to see and I would advise the next president that the Sunni Arab world's participation must be more robust. Uh, I do not accept the proposition that we should immediately put thousands and thousands of American troops into Syria in order to, in Iraq, to defeat ISIS. This is a responsibility of the Middle East itself. We can help lead, but it has to be in strong partnership with those who actually have to solve the problem for the long term. But the ISIS problem is becoming an international problem, and not only Iraqi problem. For example, Syria is affected more than, than Iraq these days. So in general, I'm asking the, the U.S. policies toward the Middle East to win this war. Well, you've got, you've got again, a complex question with a com complex set of answers. You have a diplomatic front, you have a military front, and then you have these larger questions of values and reshaping the entire political construct in the Middle East. On the diplomatic front, you continue to press for ceasefire and the conditions in which Assad would be transitioned out of governance with a replacement for the vacuum that would be left. Hopefully a replacement government that is inclusive and respectful of minority rights and that can look toward the future and somehow miraculously heal the past. Now this can't be done when you have 8th century barbarians, ISIS, running around slaughtering people and looking to expand its territory. So the first order proposition obviously is to defeat them and in a parallel fashion be working on the political and security settlement and the reframing of governance structures that allows for a transition of governance in Syria that hopefully is replaced by a just form of governance. But to simply demand that Assad go and create a vacuum could make the circumstances worse. To protect Assad and his brutality is unconscionable. So you have to have a transition period here. Again, the Sunni Arab world should be actively involved with that, and obviously the Russians must now be involved as well. Congressman, let's move to another subject with the U.S. and the Kurds. You know that in the last two years, the U.S. directly co is cooperating with the Kurds in the fight against ISIS, and they consider the Kurds and the Peshmerga and the fighters, Kurdish fighters in Syria are the most effective forces on the ground in this fight. Yeah. Still, when it comes to the political supports, the U.S., has not clear vision or, or, or a position on that. So I know a lot of people in Kurdistan will see this. And so let me tell you directly, I want to say thank you to the Kurdish people. The foreign minister sat in my office here and told me a long time ago, we are fighting for two things. We're fighting against ISIS and we're fighting for values. And look at what the Kurdish people have done by absorbing large, vast numbers of refugees from the region trying to provide appropriate shelter and stability for them. Uh, that is a values proposition. That has um, been realized by America. And the Kurdish contribution to helping to fight ISIS and the great sacrifices that the Kurdish people have taken on through the Peshmerga have been recognized here. I think you will see more and more interest in strengthening the Peshmerga and strengthening the Kurds' ability to protect not only themselves but the region. I think this is helpful in terms of determining how to regenerate the Iraqi central government as well 
So hopefully it finds its better balance. But to your question, I want to, first of all, say thanks to the Kurdish people for being willing to sacrifice though for those who are in vulnerable positions and being able and being willing to sacrifice in the fight against ISIS. And there are efforts here in the in the House and the Congress to, to directly support the course, not through the Baghdad uh, government. Yes. The government is not the US government right. and the White House is not kind of doing wants to do through uh, Baghdad. So and that's the main obstacle in front of the course in the in their yeah. fight, and they want directly uh, 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 cooperation well, with the U.S. to be to be I've, recognized. I've heard directly from the Kurdish government, and uh, I think that is a fair consideration. We must directly support the Peshmerga as best as we can. The Peshmerga have been on the front lines; they have saved innocent lives, and again, the Kurdistan area has absorbed large numbers of refugees. It's only fair to help uh, the Kurdish government directly. Uh, we want to, of course, work through the delicate, fragile tie so that it's not disruptive with the Iraqi central government. But I agree with the proposition that direct assistance to the uh, Kurdish government in its fight against ISIS is beneficial not only to Yazidis and Christians, to potentially to Syrians, and potentially as well to the Iraqi central government. Congressman Farsenberg, you are a co-chair of the Religious Minorities Cox and represents American's largest Yazidi community in your uh, town, uh, Nebraska. Last Saturday, you were celebrating with the Yazidis their New Year. Uh, tell me about that community, and has this community integrated in the U.S.? It's an amazing community, and uh, just over the last few years, people have become aware uh, that the largest refugee population uh, Yazidis is in my hometown, Lincoln, Nebraska. About a thousand, over a thousand people live there, 250 families or so. Uh, I'm proud that they call Lincoln, Nebraska their new home. On Saturday, we had an event in which they just simply wanted to thank me for helping lead the genocide resolution effort. Um, people greeted me with warm hearts and, and open arms, and there was an immediate bond of friendship. And I told the television camera that was there, I said, it's a great day to be an American. Look at people who have come here who have fled violence. By the way, many of the Yazidi members of the community there in Nebraska stood side by side our American troops in Iraq at the height of the war and did the translating for them, put themselves at great risk, and in, in turn earned their citizenship to America. And that's why they settled here. And so I was proud to stand there with them in solidarity and thank them for becoming new Americans, thank them for what they did for American troops when they were still in the Nineveh Plain and other areas, and also to celebrate with them the Yazidi New Year and understand more about this unique faith tradition. By the way, the Yazidi red and the Yazidi flag is the same color as the University of Nebraska football team, athletic team, <laughs> Cornhusker red, similar color. So there was an immediate connection. So it was a wonderful day. Um, the Yazidis have suffered greatly at the hands of ISIS, uh, and we all remember the uh, Mount Sinjar incident a year and a half ago when America came in and created the airstrikes. Uh, I know you were instrumental as well in pleading to the American government to please act. During that month of August, before the airstrike, I had a number of these young men, military translators, coming to my office and Congressman, please act, do something. There is no more time. On the verge of tears, on the verge of anger, and I don't blame them for the anger because their mothers, their aunts, their sisters were trapped and were about to die. So America intervened, and, and I commend President Obama for, for doing so. And then the hard work has begun to try to build a fragile coalition to defeat ISIS. I, not only has ISIS targeted Yazidis, as we mentioned earlier, it has tried to exterminate Christians and other religious minorities. And the persons who have died the most at their hands are innocent Muslims. That's, that's why this is such a tragedy, not just for the sake of the freedom of religion. It's a tragedy for civilization, the principles of freedom itself. But we did have a momentary pause on Saturday where we were able to come together during the Yazidi New Year, eat way too much food. I encouraged one of the Yazidis there, you need to open a restaurant and link a delicious food. And interestingly, I was at the gym myself that Sunday, Sunday night. I played some ball and then went to the weight room. And a young man came running over me and said, are you Congressman Fortin? I said, yes. 
He says, this is so great, what you've done with the Yazidis. I said, did you see a television uh, news spot? He said, yes, I saw it. So just, just another young man in the community uh, becoming more aware of who the Yazidis are and just being, joining in the celebration from afar through television as the, as the Yazidi community celebrates its new American values. Congressman, thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you. Yes. Thank you.